Just get every time. Just get moved by it. So thank you, worship team. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Living Waters. Uh, I'm Rob Olson. I'm the associate pastor of Connection Ministries here. Um, our lead pastor, Scott Peterson, is not here today. Uh, his wife, Julie, had knee surgery a few days ago, Thursday. And uh, so she's at home recovering and he's at home taking care of her. Uh, so uh, it is my privilege and honor to uh, teach God's word to you this morning. Um, but before we get into the word, I uh, just want to highlight a couple of announcements. Um, so first of all, we have some uh, missionaries visiting with us today. The Cheetahs, I think is how you say it. All right. Um, uh, Roman, Emily, and their children, Henry and Josette. You guys want to just stand up so we can uh, say hi to you guys? Um, they're visiting from Moldova, so stop and say hi to them. They'll be having lunch with the mission team later. I forgot to dismiss the kids, but I think they made their way out already. If there's any kids in here up to grade five, uh, go ahead and make your way out. All right. Um, I also want to give a, a short update on our two services. Um, so you can put those slides up there, Dean. Um, so we started, we added the second service back in September uh, as part of our open arms movement, wanting to open our arms to our community and just welcome all of those who God continues to bring here to Living Waters. And we've, uh, compared to, uh, you know, when we started, we've seen a 12 to 14 percent increase uh, in our average attendance on Sunday mornings. So we're just continuing to grow God's continuing to bring people here uh, to our body. And so we want to continue to uh, keep our arms open uh, to everyone that walks in here and welcome them. Um, and I just uh, want to give a special thank you to all the people who have helped uh, with that transition to two services, to making it go smoothly and successfully. The list of people would be way too long. We'd be here all day if I uh, was thanking all of you individually. Um, but I just want to thank you. It it's, uh, took a lot of extra work from a lot of volunteers, a lot of planning and prep. Um, and we couldn't have done it without each and every one of those people. So thank you all um, for your efforts in that. Um, we do have a couple of uh, summer events that are coming up. There's some half sheets of paper that look like this um, on the usher table and out in the comments out there. Feel free to grab one. Uh, as always, you can check our church calendar online. But this just highlights a few of the things we've got going on over the summer. So even though a lot of our regular ministries stop for the summer, uh, we won't be having Sunday school classes, we won't, be, we won't be having our Wednesday night children's ministry, those types of things. That doesn't mean we're not doing anything. Uh, we still want to uh, have opportunities to get together as a church and enjoy spending time and doing things together. Um, so grab one of those. And next week on uh, Wednesday the 29th, we'll be sort of kicking off the summer with a food and fellowship time, uh, which... It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we just eat food and we spend time together. Um, so hopefully the, you know, we'll be outside uh, enjoying the nice weather in our nice backyard out here. Dan's cooking up his, uh, his internationally famous pork kebabs, right? Um, and uh, you can uh, bring a side dish. You can sign up online um, to do that. And uh, yeah, just come uh, spend some time enjoying a delicious meal and playing games outside. Just getting to know some other people from the body here. Um, and then lastly, uh, just another reminder that next week we are starting our summer schedule. Next week is Memorial Weekend already. So uh, one service, 10 a.m. through the summer starting next week, okay? One service, 10 a.m. through the summer. Let's say that together. One service, 10 a.m. through the summer. I know a lot of you are getting sick of hearing that. But that means you're remembering it. So, good job. All right. Uh, and you guys have a little more learning curve than the people at 9 because they're already going to be up. But, uh, you know, if you come at 1030, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna miss some good stuff. So, um, one service, 10 a.m., starting next week. All right. Enough of that. Let's uh, go ahead and get into the word. Um, so, Pastor Scott's been doing a uh, sermon series on the book of Romans. He's going to be wrapping up that series uh, next week during the one service at 10 a.m. Um, and uh, finishing up Romans chapter 16. But today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, so go ahead and turn there if you have a Bible. 
Uh, and if you need one, there are some extras on the usher table in the back that you can feel free to use and to take. Um, <coughs> so I chose this passage today um, because I want to talk about a particular person from the Bible, uh, a person named Paul, who if you've been in the church any amount of time, you've probably heard of the Apostle Paul. He was a pretty big deal. He wrote a lot of the books of the New Testament, including what we're going to read today, 1 Corinthians, and including the book of Romans. We can hear a lot about his story in the book of Acts. Uh, so he's a, he's a prominent figure in the New Testament, probably second only really to Jesus. <clears throat> um, and Paul is such just like an amazing example. Um, like we might even think of him as like a super Christian, right? It re- if there really is such a thing, which there's not really. Um, but, you know, he's like just such a powerful example. He was uh, just this incredibly gifted apostle evangelist, teacher, leader, church planter, a remarkable example of intimacy with Christ and with the Holy Spirit, and a powerful example of the transformation that God's grace can bring in our lives. Um, So I'd encourage you to, you know, go study his story some more after today, but we're just going to get a snapshot into his life um, because we can learn a lot from him. He's a great example to us. In fact, in... um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I uh, saw this funny meme online, and I thought, that, that pretty accurately sums up kind of how I feel. I don't know about you, but how I feel about, Christ, uh, about Paul's statement to imitate him as he imitates Christ. Um, which is a pretty powerful, pretty bold thing for Paul to say. He had so much confidence in his walk with Christ that he was able to say to, to the people he's writing to and to all of us, like, if you want to be like Jesus, just be like me, is essentially what he's saying. Like, look what I do and do what I do, and then you'll be doing what Jesus did. You'll be like him. And honestly, I'd probably be a little nervous to say that to any of you, but as I've been studying and preparing for this, like, I'm like, I really want that to be my ambition in life. What if each of us could get to a point where I, we could say, if somebody says, you know, what is Jesus like? They could just look at you and they would know. That's what Jesus is like. Or if someone says, I want to be more like Jesus, I could just point to someone in this body and say, well, just go be more like that person. And then you'll be well on your way to being more like Jesus. Uh, So today, um, we're going to zoom in on one particular aspect of Paul's life that we can imitate in order to become more like Paul and more like Christ. And specifically, one aspect that I think really is one of the most important aspects of Paul's identity and his character and kind of um, is the foundation for everything else in his life. And you may have picked up on what that theme is from our songs, but that word is grace. We're going to focus on grace and seeing God's grace through Paul's life. And again, as an example that we can learn from in our own lives. And specifically, I want us to think about how grace influenced Paul's identity. Because what we're going to see is that Paul had a grace based identity, all right? So let's start, um, I'm going to start by reading verses uh, 1 through 8 of 1 Corinthians 15, so you can follow along. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for the apostle Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And that phrase, fallen asleep, that's Paul's way of saying that a believer has died. Um, but they've, they've fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, Jesus' brother, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. 
So I wanted to start here. You may think, this, what does this have to do with Paul? Isn't he talking about Jesus? Well, yes, um, but, he, oops, wrong way. He's talking about the gospel. And we ha- so we have to understand the first things first, right? Paul says that this is of first importance. This is the most important thing, okay? So if you hear nothing else that I say today, hear this. The gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. After three days, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to all, a whole bunch of people, more than 500 people. We have to start with the gospel when we're talking about grace. Because the gospel is where we get grace. It's the only place we can get grace. If we don't have the gospel, then we don't have grace. Grace, the gospel, is the means by which we receive God's grace. And we are grounded in grace. Everything Paul said and did from the moment he received God's grace was grounded on this one truth, this one fact of the gospel. Which, by the way, notice what he some things he says about the gospel here. So he he kind of summarizes it, right? Christ died for our sins. Uh, He was buried. He rose on the third day. But then notice the other things he says. Twice he says this happened in accordance with the scriptures. He says it twice, okay? And to Paul, what he is calling the scriptures is what we would call the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't all been written yet. He was in the process of writing it. Uh, But the Old Testament. So what Paul is saying is all this stuff that happened to Jesus, it was predicted in the Old Testament. The Old Testament contains well over 300 specific prophecies that are fulfilled by Jesus. Things that were written hundreds or thousands of years before Jesus walked the earth that talk directly about things that happened to Jesus. That can't be a coincidence that someone could write something 1,500 years before about something that, a person that didn't even exist yet as a human being. But there are more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus. He also says, he mentions all these people that Christ appeared to, to Peter, or Cephas, he calls him, the 12 apostles, um, his own brother, James, and then he says more than 500 other people that Christ appeared to after his resurrection. Why is he bringing that up? Well, essentially what Paul is saying, notice he also says, most of whom are still alive. He emphasizes that because he's, what he's saying to the Corinthians is he's saying, guys, You don't have to take my word for it. I'm not making this up. There are 500 other people out there who saw the same thing that I saw, who experienced the same thing that I experienced, and you can go and talk to them because they're still alive. Of course, they're not alive today, but when he was writing this, right, he's saying to the Corinthians, you can verify the story that I'm telling you. You can go and you can investigate this information and find out that it's true. He's not just making it up. It's an actual historical fact that these things happen. And the evidence, by the way, is overwhelming. If you've never studied it or you're wondering, did these things really happen? Did, you, was, did Jesus really say these things and do these things? You can come talk to me later. We can have a more in-depth conversation about that. I can point you to some resources, but there's overwhelming evidence that these things are true. You can actually investigate it and find that this is a historical fact. So I know our society likes to market faith as this thing that's not really based on anything. It's just something you decide to believe just because you feel like it. But that's not at all what the Bible teaches. It's it's teaching us real events that actually happen, and our faith is based on historical facts that can be investigated. And then finally, Paul says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul was the last person whom the resurrected Christ appeared to in person before his ascension. But 
Um, he, so now he draws on his personal experience as well. I personally have seen and experienced Christ. So he's kind of got these three key points to back up his story of the gospel, okay? That it's based on God's word. God's word is reliable. It's, it's provable. We can look at all these things that these people wrote hundreds and thousands of years before and see how they predicted what would, and prophesied what would happen to Christ. We can look at the historical information and eyewitness accounts and know for a fact that this actually happened. And then finally, we can also give our own testimonies and say, I, this is how I experienced Christ as well. And when we add all of those things up, it's, I think it's pretty undeniable to say that this is not real. That the fact is our faith is based on real events that actually happen in a real person. But we have to start with the gospel when we talk about grace because that is the only means of grace. And when we receive the gospel, we're grounded in grace and then we'll see what happens as we continue to grow in grace as we have a grace-based identity. Okay, we're going to see a few elements of what that looks like here. So let's read verses 8 and 9. Paul says, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Okay, so... Oops, wrong way again. Sorry. <laughs> so Paul calls himself the least of the apostles. He says that he is unworthy to be called an apostle. So God's grace gives Paul a way to have a proper perspective on his life now. Okay, Paul, he, he mentions he was persecuting the church. You can read about this in the book of Acts. When the, the gospel, the apostles first were filled with the Holy Spirit and they started preaching the gospel and going around all these places, Paul was hunting down Christians and throwing them in jail and persecuting them. And at the time, Paul thought that what he was doing was good and right. It's only once he received God's grace that he was able to have a proper perspective on what he was doing and recognize that it was, in fact, wrong and sinful. He thought he was doing what was good and right, but it was God's grace is the only thing that gave him a proper perspective on his sin. As we grow in grace, we become more aware of our sin because God's grace, when he gives us a grace-based identity, it allows us to see ourselves accurately. Because without God's grace, Paul couldn't see himself accurately. He thought he was doing things that were good and right and that made sense. And that's without God's grace, we see people living all kinds of ways that maybe don't make sense to us. But without God's grace, they can't see any differently. And neither can we. Before I accepted the gospel and received God's grace, there was no way I could see my sin accurately. So God's grace gives us a proper perspective. We sang in a song just a few minutes ago, I was a wretch. I remember who I was. And that's what Paul is saying here. I remember my past. I remember how wretched I was. And in that, in that uh, video we watched from the Gideons as well, the, as the guy reflected on his past and recounted all of these things that he had done, he, he said, there was nothing good in me. But he's only, he can see that beca now because God's grace gives him a proper perspective on his past. Paul puts it this way in 1 Timothy 1.15. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Essentially what Paul's saying is, I am the worst sinner that I know. I'm the worst sinner I can imagine. Yeah, God, God came to save me, but I'm the worst sinner that I know. And he, when he says this is a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance, what he's saying is all of us should think this way about ourselves. 
the more I understand God's grace, the more clearly I'm able to see my sin. And I, I'm the worst sinner that I know because I can see my own sin a lot more clearly than I can see anybody else's. However, this is only half the picture. We can't stop here. And this is something that took me a long time to learn. For a lot of my life, you could have described me as a verse 9 Christian only. <laughs> um, because I resonated with Paul's statements. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. Meaning, like, I'm not, even, I'm not as good as all those other guys. I can never be as good as Peter or as John or as any of these other guys, maybe a little better than Judas, but anybody else, like, he's like, I'm the least. I'm not as good as them. He says, I'm wor un unworthy of being called an apostle. I'm not qualified. I don't deserve that. And that's how I lived my life for a long time. Just feeling like I was the least. I was not good enough. I was unworthy. I was unqualified. I didn't deserve anything from God. And so as people, people around me, fortunately, were wise enough to see things in me, see gifts that God had given me, and try to call me out to use them, but a lot of times I avoided them because I thought of myself this way. And unfortunately, I hear this kind of thinking pretty commonly in our culture and even in the church. People who think they aren't good enough. People who think, I can't do that because I'm not qualified. I could never be as good as this other person, so I'm just not going to do it at all. And that was me for years and years. I was a verse 9 only Christian. But the good news is Paul doesn't stop at verse 9. We need that proper perspective. We need to understand, as he did, that as he said, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm unqualified. I'm, I'm unworthy. But we have to move on from there, too. Because I keep going the wrong way. Okay. Because then in verse 10, there's this very important word, but. It's a small word, but it would be difficult to overstate the importance of this word, but. Yes, it is true I'm the least of the apostles. Yes, it's true I'm not as good as everybody else. Yes, it's true I'm unworthy of God's grace. Yes, it's true that I'm unqualified. But, but there's something else that's also true. There's something greater that is also true. We can't overemphasize this word, but. That's why I gave it a whole slide to itself. It's so important. But. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. Now, I, I titled this part, True Humility, okay? Because I think this is one of the most powerful descriptions of true humility that we see throughout Scripture or anywhere else. I think on the, on the previous slide, I put, don't confuse humiliation with humility, Okay? And again, this took me a very long time to learn. I confuse self-humiliation with humility. We think a lot of times that humility is this beating ourselves up, constantly telling myself, I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified. I can't do that. I can't help. I can't do anything because I'm so unworthy and I'm so little and I'm not as good as so-and-so. But that's not true humility. That's a false humility. This is what we see. This is the example of true humility that, that Paul gives us. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, unfortunately, this phrase, I am what I am, is probably more associated with Popeye than with Paul. Um, some people in this room, I don't think, even know who Popeye is, but that's okay. Um, but this phrase, I am what I am, I want us to focus on this for for a minute, because what Paul is saying here is making an identity statement. I am what I am. This is a statement of his identity, the core of his being. I am what I am. 
And not just Popeye, but we actually hear a lot of this kind of talk in our culture. People may not use this exact same phrase, I am what I am, but we hear variations of this identity statement. We hear things like, I was born this way. I didn't choose to be the way that I am. This is just who I am. We hear these kinds of statements, and it's the same kind of statement that, that Paul is making here. It's an identity statement about who we are in the core of our being. But unfortunately, when we hear this in our world, usually it means one of two things. Usually, people either are using this as a way to say, I am the one who decides who I am. Who de- I am the one who determines my identity. And you and nobody else, you don't have any say in it. It's up to me and me alone. Or people use these kinds of phrases as a way to basically say, you know, when the people say things like, this is who I am, a lot of times they're just saying, I'm not going to bother trying to better myself. I am uninterested in changing or being anything other than I am right now. So they m- may not say the, with their words, but that's a lot of times what's being communicated is I'm just not going to bother trying to change myself. But neither of those is what Paul is saying here. Because we have to remember the first half of this sentence. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Coming back to that, being grounded and growing in grace. Everything for Paul is connected to grace. If you read Paul's letters, I mean, the word grace shows up all over the place. And he recognizes by the grace of God, I am what I am. In the words of another popular worship song, he's basically saying, I am who you say I am, God. What, he's, what Paul is saying is, it is God's grace that determines who I am. Not me. I have no right to my own identity because of the gospel, because of what Christ did for me. So I have no right to define myself. That's God's right. God's grace is what makes me who I am and nothing else. That's what Paul is saying. And that's what I want each of us to think about ourselves. That it is God's grace alone that makes us who we are. So grace-based identity, as I said earlier, allows us to see ourselves accurately, to see our sin. But it also allows us to see ourselves then from God's perspective. To see myself from the perspective of my sin is to see my unworthiness that I don't deserve God's grace, but to see myself as God sees me is to see myself through his grace, as Paul did. And this is what true humility is, this statement. By the grace of God, I am what I am. True humility is surrendering my identity to God's grace, letting go of it. I have no right to define myself anymore. I am giving that right to God because of his grace knowing that whatever he gives is going to be a lot better than whatever I could come up with. So, for Paul, that meant being an apostle. He recognizes, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I don't deserve that. But, that's what God says I am, so that's what I am. Because God defines me. Now, maybe something different for each of us, but for Paul, it was being an apostle. So, whether God's calling you to be an apostle or a a teacher, or a leader, or a parent, or a servant, or whatever it is, what does God say about you? Who does God say that you are? That's who I am. And that leads us to the next part of verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary... I worked harder than any of them, the them being the other apostles. I worked harder than any 
of the other apostles. It was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So what we see is that because of Paul's grace-based identity, it leads him to a purposeful striving. He says, I worked harder than any other apostle. Okay? And what we see is this progression, how he's bringing these things together. Okay? I put up there, it says, true humility plus proper perspective equals working hard to be worthy. Right? So we take these last two ideas that we talked about. Right? So Paul, on the one hand, Paul has this perspective on his life. He says, I can look at my past, I can look at my sin and the things that I've done, and I know that I'm unworthy of God's grace. And yet, on the other hand, God has said that this is who I am. He's given me his grace. He's called me an apostle. So Paul's got these two things that he's holding, right? Both of which he acknowledges are true. So now he has a choice. He can either say, well, because I'm unworthy, I'm not going to do that. Because I don't, I'm unqualified and I'm not good enough to be an apostle, then I'm not going to make an effort to be an apostle. I'm just going to avoid it. I'm going to walk away from it. Well, what that is, is that's pride when we do that. Right? As we saw earlier with this idea of false humility, a lot of times we confuse humiliation with humility. We think humility means thinking like thinking less of ourselves, thinking that we're not worthy, that we're not good enough. And then we, but often that means we reject the things that God is calling us to. But that's not what Paul does. He takes these two things and he says, well, I know I'm unworthy to be an apostle, but God says I'm an apostle, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to work hard to become worthy to be an apostle. I know I'm the least, I'm the least qualified to be an apostle. That means I have to work even harder to become a worthy of it, to be qualified. He puts it this way in Ephesians 4, chapter 1. He says, I urge each of you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And that's what Paul's modeling here. He received this calling to be an apostle, and he's set himself to strive toward living a life worthy of that calling. So he works hard in order to become worthy, to become qualified. But we have to be careful. We have to understand that our identity is based on grace, not on those qualifications and that hard work. It's easy to get sucked into this mentality of working hard to earn something from God. But that's not how grace works. That's the opposite of grace. What makes grace grace is that we did nothing to deserve it. We can do nothing to earn it or to deserve it. But when our identity is based in that fact, that should drive us to work hard. We're not driven by achievements, but we are driven to achievements. Let me give you an example of um, how this might translate into our context, okay? So I'm up here. I, you know, if I see you guys out there and I say hi, most of you are going to say, you know, oh, hi, Pastor Rob. Good morning, Pastor Rob. Something like that, right? Pastor Rob, that's who I am, okay? But I want to be clear about something. I'm not a pastor because I work here. I'm fortunate to be on staff at this church, but that is not what makes me a pastor. See, typically what happens when a church is looking for a pastor, and you guys did this a few years ago, when you began the search that led to me being hired here, you put together a list of duties and a list of qualifications. And then you look for people who meet those qualifications, and then you call someone to come and fill the role. So you looked at my qualifications, you said, hey, this guy meets all the qualifications, you looked at some other people too, but then ultimately I was chosen and called to be the pastor here because of my qualifications. But in God's eyes, it's the other way around. In, in God's eyes, call precedes qualifications. 
And if you, if you realize that, call precedes qualification. I mean, read through the Bible. Every single story, every single leader, every single person you see, it's almost universal. You look at Abraham, Moses, David, Samuel, <laughs> Paul, Peter, any of these guys. Not one of them was the kind of person that the world would look at and go, oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good choice. It's a good fit for that. Let's pick this scrawny, wimpy little shepherd kid who wasn't even invited to the party to be the king of the whole nation. Nobody, like, God doesn't choose the qualified. His call precedes qualification. He doesn't look for those who are qualified and then decide to call them. And Paul understood that, that his call to be an apostle was not based on anything that he did or earned. It was simply because of God's grace. Call precedes qualification. So what makes me a pastor is not the fact that I'm on staff here. What makes me a pastor is the fact that God called me to be a pastor. And by the grace of God, that's, I am what I am. I'm very fortunate that you as a church have recognized that calling and given me the opportunity to work here. But being on staff at a church is not what makes someone a pastor. It's God's call on our lives. And so I ought to recognize that in my own life, and then that leads to this purposeful striving. See, uh, some of the best pastors that I've had in my life didn't have a seminary education. They didn't have a bunch of letters after their name. They didn't spend a bunch of money to get a fancy piece of paper to frame on their wall. Okay? I have all those things. I have a, a Master of Divinity degree. I have a Master of Theology degree. I have experience. I have training. I've served as a missionary. I've done all these things. I have these experiences and training and qualifications to draw on. But again, that's not what makes me a pastor. I have those things because I understood God's call on my life and I strived to be the best that I could be at it. I can think of two pastors specifically that I've had the... That I've had the privilege to know who, they didn't have a, a seminary education, didn't have the pastoral training, but they were called to be pastors, and a church recognized that and called them, but their response was to go and get the education and the training, and uh, to strive to be the best at what God called them to be, and who God called them to be. So call precedes qualification, but call also motivates us to pursue those qualifications. Be the best at whoever God has called us to be. So in uh, Colossians 3.23, this is Paul again. He reminds us, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And so we strive purposefully toward who God has called us to be. Okay, let's um, read the next, the last verse, verse 11. Whether then it was I or they, that they again is the other apostles, whether then it was I or the other apostles, so we preached and so you believed. What is Paul's point here? Well, when we have a grace-based identity, it gives us an outward focus. It gives us an outward focus. Paul says, what he's saying is, I, it, it doesn't really matter to me whether it was I, I'm the one who preached to you. As long as whether it was me or it was somebody else, I'm just glad that it happened. See, Paul was called to be an apostle, an evangelist, a church planter. He actually says specifically that his call, his goal in life was to go and preach the gospel in all the places it had not yet been preached. But... Paul didn't get upset when other people accomplished that goal instead of him. We heard from the Gideons this morning how they give out, I mean, have given out, what, billions of Bibles over the years. But I think if the, if the Gideons showed up somewhere with their Bibles and they saw, oh, these people already have Bibles, they're not going to be upset and say, oh, gosh, I can't believe somebody else gave them Bibles. What are you doing? No, they're going to be excited. Thank God these people have God's word. Right? Because it, it's not about us. It's not about this is what I want to do. And so I'm, 
I'm going to get upset if somebody else, right, achieves it on my behalf. No, what Paul has an outward focus because of his grace-based identity. His desire is simply to serve others and to glorify God. And his preaching the gospel was a way to do that. It, he didn't care about earning achievements or successes for himself. He was not motivated by that at all. He did a very good job at what he did. He almost accomplished his goal. He was very good at it, but he, it didn't matter to him whether it, he was the one doing it or somebody else was doing it because he knew his identity was not based on his accomplishments. It was based on grace. And so that frees him to release his identity and simply serve others and glorify God. I said earlier that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but humility is thinking of yourself less. Paul's not thinking about himself and all the things he can do and accomplish. He's thinking about the goal of serving others and glorifying God. And first, in Philippians 2 verse 4, he puts it this way. Let each of you look not only to his interests, but also to the interests of others. And then in 1 Corinthians 10 31, he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Paul wasn't trying to make himself successful or build up his achievements. He was simply trying to serve others and glorify God because a grace-based identity gives him this outward focus. And we ought to strive hard to be good at who God has called us to be, but not let that define us. Scott has talked a lot about, in his sermons over the last several weeks, a lot about serving. That's been an important theme in the book of Romans. A few weeks ago, he even had some batons and talked about how <coughs> excuse me, some of our ministries have sort of been dropped and encouraged us to come and serve. But I want to be clear about something, that our goal is not for you to come and get, uh, get you to do a bunch of stuff for us. Our goal is not to get you to do all these things so that Living Waters can become big and popular and make lots of money or anything like that. Our goal is simply that we want you to be who God has called you to be and to be the best of who God has called you to be. And if he is calling you to serve, then serve. If he is calling you to lead, then lead. It's not about us. We want to serve you in developing this, this grace-based identity. We want to glorify God by serving his body and serving our community. And for some of you, that might even mean that you're called somewhere outside of Living Waters. You may be called to serve in a ministry that's not part of our body. You may be called even to serve in a different area of our country or our world. And if that's the case, I don't want you here. If God is calling you to serve somewhere else, I do not want you here. I want you to be where God has called you to be. I want you to be doing what God has called you to do. And most importantly, I want you to be the person that God has called you to be. Because it's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about living waters. It's about glorifying God and serving others. Because when we have this grace-based identity, we want other people to know it. We want to share the gospel with them so that they too can have this grace-based identity and glorify God with all that they have. And so that's why we're going to sing one last song together called I Give You My Heart. I chose this song because I think it really is how I hope we will respond today to God's grace. That you would give him your heart, give him your soul, give him yourself, give him your identity so that we can receive his grace-based identity instead and respond to his grace by, by just giving him everything, all of our effort, all of our breath, all of our resources, that we would work hard to be the best at who God has called us to be. So, Lord, we thank you for your unbelievable, unimaginable grace that you have shown to us.
Help us to not hold on to our, den- our identities as our own possession, but to recognize that our identity is a gift from you. Help us all to strive purposefully to live a life worthy of the calling that, that you have called us to. Not for our own sake, but seeking always to serve others and to glorify you in all that we do. So we give you our hearts and our souls this morning. In Jesus' name.